you're in for a real treat this evening, and I'm blessed to be able to welcome uh, Professor Steve Fuller to Virtual Futures. My name is Luke Robert Mason, and for those of you who are here for the first time, the Virtual Futures Conference first occurred at the University of Warwick in the mid-90s. And to quote its co-founder, it arose at a tipping point in the technologization of first world cultures. Now, what is most often portrayed as a techno-positivist festival of accelerationism towards a post-human future, the Glastonbury of cyberculture, as The Guardian put it, its actual aim, hidden behind the brush steel, the silicon, the jargon, the designer drugs, the charismatic prophets, and the techno parties, was much more sober and much more urgent. What Virtual Futures did, or at least tried to do, was cast a critical eye over the phenomenal changes in how humans and non-humans engage with emerging scientific theory and technological development. This salon series completes the conference's aim to bury the 20th century and to begin work on the 21st. So, let's begin. Tonight, we're joined by philosopher and sociologist Professor Steve Fuller to discuss his new book, Post-Truth, Knowledge as a Power Game. Post-truth has a lot to answer for, from the election of Donald Trump to the results of Brexit. But Professor Fuller reveals the post-truth phenomena is nothing new. It has always been a feature of Western thought, not a recent bug. In fact, Steve's framing attempts to recognize the phenomena as a moment of intellectual clarity. So to provide us with ideas that might serve our interests and perhaps even serve what our interests are, please put your hands together and join me in welcoming Professor Steve Fuller to the Virtual Futures stage. Thank you. Thank you. So despite what we've heard, post-truth doesn't begin with Trump. It actually begins with, oddly enough, Plato. That's right, yes. Um, and, and this is kind of, you might say, the twist of, of my book and my general orientation to post-truth. First of all, I'm not negative toward it. That already distinguishes me from everyone else who's written about it, because the, uh, according to the Oxford English Dictionary, which I think has a very post-truth definition of post-truth, right, uh, it was word of the year in 2016, and that's not a coincidence, right? It had to do with Brexit and had to do with Trump. And it was connected to the idea, as it states in the definition, that um, arguments are won by appealing to emotion rather than reason. That's actually what it says in the Oxford English Dictionary. Okay? To me, that's a post-truth definition of post-truth because what it's doing is it is kind of positioning the different parties in Brexit and Trump so that one party, the party that lost, is appe appeals to be uh, appears as the rational party, whereas the party that won is is made to appear as the emotional party. And of course, this kind of so this is a very interesting thing. It's interesting that a dictionary, an official, an authoritative dictionary, actually has this very post truth definition of post truth. But what it highlights is what post truth is really about. Post truth is about being able to frame the game in which you try to get a strategic advantage over your opponent. And so this is where we are at the moment. In logic, we talk about second order issues. That is to say, beyond the level of talking about what's true and false, you talk about what can be true or false, right? And that has to do with framing. And, and, and the framing basically amounts to the background assumptions that people are supposed to be taking for granted in terms of which then things are regarded as true and false. And this is the thing that's been shaken up by the so-called post-truth condition, because it's no longer just in the hands of one particular set of authorities who are in lockstep with each other and so forth. I mean, I think one of the things that would have been very noticeable to you if you were following either the Brexit campaign or Donald Trump's election is the way in which the Brexiteers and, and the Trumpistas were positioning the opponents as all in lockstep, right? So you have the bankers and the lawyers and the academics and the people who've been in power forever. They're all thinking the same way. And it's that if you change the way we've been operating, they'll just be chaos. Chaos will fall off the precipice. There's no other way of operating but the way we've been operating in the past. And this is the thing that the Brexiteers and the Trumpistas overturned. 
And they got basically got people to frame the situation in a way that did not conform to the dominant authoritative expert way of seeing things. And that is the post-truth condition. It is this ability to rise to the second order where you're able to turn around the terms of engagement so that what people thought had been true in the past is now cast into enormous doubt and the stuff that in the past would have been seen as either false or impossible is now seen as reasonably plausible. That is where we are now. So in the book, you focus on and looking at Plato and understanding how dealing with post-truth was something that he was yes. dealing with, with the Greeks, with regards to first order and second order thinking. I, I just wondered why you started there with regards to your historical framing of this entire, what seems to be a very modern phenomena. Well, here's the thing. I mean, we normally, th when for those of you who have studied the history of philosophy or, you know, Western intellectual history, Plato's the founder, Right. Um, and, and, and Plato is, uh, and the thing about Plato, especially through his mouthpiece, Socrates, and I think it's always worth noticing from the standpoint of our concern about fake news and so forth, is that Plato only knew Socrates toward the end of Socrates' life. So all the stuff that he's talking about that happens largely before the trial of Socrates is pretty much probably fake news in the sense that it was probably made up, right? Plato is a very young person at the time that Socrates commits suicide. He is not someone who's been with him the whole time. Um, but then one might say similar things about St. Paul with regard to Jesus, who they never even met. Um, but, the, but the point is, so, so fake news goes very deep in the history of Western culture in, in very important ways, it seems to me. Um, but in any case, the point here that, that, that Plato and Socrates, the reason why we think of them as being the founders of Western philosophy is because these are the guys that put truth on the table. Right, that truth in a sense is the ultimate value and all of these disagreements that people have about what you should believe based on your interests and who's more powerful and so forth, uh, in a sense, are not good enough. That there's this ultimate standard of truth. However, if you look at how exactly Plato uh, was uh, going to get this ultimate standard of truth uh, to be uh, recognized by the people, you realize it's actually quite an interesting sort of authoritarian strategy. Um, and what I talk about in the book uh, is what I call monopoly intellectualism, right? Uh, we, we know how monopolies work, right? You sort of innovate, you put forward an idea, and then you basically make it impossible for any competitors to enter the market, okay? And this is what Plato was up to. And the thing that Plato was most concerned about in his own lifetime were the playwrights. The playwrights, the poets, these were the people who were conjuring up alternative realities. And as a result, were com and the sophists as well, of course, the people who, who Socrates dealt with most directly, these sophists who were also people who taught about how you could win arguments in, in public debate and so forth. All of these people were basically saying, look, the world is your oyster. It's open with possibilities. You know, if you just know, you know, if you just listen to what I'm saying, if you just get taught these certain kinds of skills, you can turn any situation to your advantage, right? It was this very open-ended, very possibilistic, pluralistic kind of world. And of course, what this led to in the case of Athens was this enormous amount of disorder and chaos. So even though it was seen as a very lively place, and of course, we still remember all of the great dramas and all the rest of it that was going on there and all the great philosophers and all this kind of stuff, nevertheless, it was a political disaster zone at the end of the day, right? It, it, from, from the standpoint, and this is where reading Thucydides, another fake news guy, in fact, I dedicate the book to Thucydides. He's usually, Thucydides is this guy who's normally seen as the founder of scientific history because he gives this very detailed kind of account of what was going on in the Peloponnesian Wars, which was kind of the war where Athens finally was, was trounced. You know, after all this volatility, Sparta beat Athens. And basically what Thucydides, who was a general in the Athenian army early in that time, is basically recounting how Athens fell. And he's doing it in a very detailed manner where he's giving you a lot of transcripts of speeches, or so it seems. But then you ask, how does he know? He wasn't really there. He's just heard this stuff. And then he, you know, he kind of embellishes basically in a very interesting, persuasive way. So he's Mr. Fake News, right? And so I dedicate my book to him, even though he's the man who's regarded as the, as the founder of scientific history, objective history. If, you, if those of you who have ever started, studied history as a discipline will know Thucydides is the man you begin with. But from our standpoint, we would look at what he's doing. There's no evidence that any of the people he's saying said the things they said actually said them. I mean, at least Plato had the courtesy of saying he was doing dialogues, okay? But Thucydides claims to be doing history. 
So this is very, you know, so, so this is a very deep kind of thing. But the point is that, that Plato basically didn't want this to happen again, because by the time that Plato is writing his dialogues, Athens is already pretty much defeated. Okay, the volatility had already overcome the system. And he doesn't want any of this stuff to happen again. And that's what the Republic, right, Plato's main work is about. It's about training philosopher kings and how they can get the kind of knowledge and authority that's needed to get people to realize that there's only one truth and that everything else is just fantasy. Everything else is just fiction. In other words, do not blur the boundaries, right? And the problem with the playwrights and the poets and the sophists was that they were making the possible, the imaginative, seem almost as real as the stuff that was on the ground, and so they were blurring the difference between the possible and the impossible, between the fact and fiction. And that was the source of volatility in ancient Athens. And Plato was going to make sure this never happens again. And that is what monopoly intellectualism is about. And that is how we get the kind of fetish about truth that has been so much kind of the red thread that has gone through the history of Western philosophy. Well, the post-truth tradition is less about true and false and it, you say in the book it's more about controlling what the rules actually are yeah. so could you just explain that why is it about this this control of the game itself well because it has to do with who's allowed to speak right the, for those of you who are familiar with michel foucault this is kind of the issue we're talking about here right uh we're, we're talking because because the rules of the game basically has to do with how you become a player and Plato is very clear in the Republic that you need a certain kind of training, and this is where the philosopher King's education comes in, and it's very, and we can go into details about it, uh, but the point is he's very deliberate that basically only a certain kind of person actually uh, should be authorized to be able to speak the truth, okay? Um, and, and of course there could be disagreement amongst those people, so Plato's not necessarily saying they would all say the same thing, but the level of disagreement between them would be within a very circumscribed arena, you know, uh, and, and this is where um, one of the things I talk about at this part of the book is about um, the American journalist, Walter Lippmann. I don't know if you're familiar with him. Walter Lippmann is often seen as a, the, the founder of professional journalism. And what is professional journalism? It is presenting the world in an objective, neutral way. In fact, the manner is relatively affectless. You know, so if you think about how news people present on television even, right, uh, the language is not emotive. Um, I mean, and this is something that only really starts to take root um, after World War I, because journalism up to that point, uh, especially in the United States, in this country, of course, Lippmann wasn't such a strong influence, so journalism remains rather ideological and polarized and emotional and so forth. But in the United States, if you think about the whole idea of where do you get the standard that the New York Times supposedly sets, right, all the news that's fit to print. Right, that kind of idea. And, and if you read the New York Times, right, deliberate attempt to kind of make it, to dampen down any kind of ideological sens sensibility. This is Walter Lippmann, and the point is that this is the way you present truth to the people. So regardless of how, what kind of disagreements are happening among the elites who actually rule everything, and they're disagreeing within a relatively narrow space, what you present to the people is going to be this kind of neutral, objective, don't worry about it, there's, you know, whatever problems there are, even if it's the Vietnam War or whatever we're talking about, the, the experts will sort it out for you. You know, so we're just giving you the facts and, and, and you just, we don't want you to participate in this process, right? So this is the latter day Platonism, right? This is where, where, you know, Platonism in a democratic society comes about, is in this kind of persona that I think is quite recognizable as far as, you know, so-called objective journalism is concerned, where basically the affect that's being conveyed to you is that you have nothing to worry about. Yes, there are problems. Yes, there are disagreements. But when you wake up tomorrow morning, the world will still be there. Well, the environment we're in right now feels like there are dichotomies that 
give rise to certain types of truth. Everybody has, to a degree, their own truth, and they exist amongst these uh, these uh, dichotomies of facts versus emotion, as you said, with the with the definition of post-truth. But also, there's the the difference between the elite experts and the the populist demagogues, as you describe them in the book, and the, and the lions and the foxes. Yeah. Uh, I wonder if you could could touch a little bit more upon the oh, no. post-truth merchants and how do we categorize them, and is it even useful to categorize them in such a dichotomous sort of way. Well, this is he's he's picking up a point that that runs through the book, namely that I I actually do uh, dichotomize because um, one of the you might say a framing device for me in thinking about post truth is this idea that ultimately the post truth condition is about what in the Machiavellian political tradition, and that's the tradition that I'm primarily tapping into when I write this book, uh, it calls uh, the circulation of elites. And they're basically two types of elites. And, and who these people are at any given time, they could change their identity. So what we're talking about are types, right? We're not necessarily, you know, so if you say, oh, well, this politician is definitely this, it might be this today, but tomorrow it might be the opposite, okay? So it has to do with the power dynamics between the two positions. And this is where the lions and foxes come in. This is the terms from Machiavelli, which were updated um, in the late 19th century by Vilfredo Pareto, um, who is one of the, he's the Italian founder of sociology, basically. He was a political economist. He's the guy responsible for, some of you may know, the 80-20 rule. That's Pareto's law. It's the idea that, you know, 80% of the resources are in the hands of 20% of the people. 80% of the effects are caused by 20% of the available causes, right? This is kind of a general kind of principle that applies to a lot of things. And it's a principle about elitism, basically. Okay, how, about uh, how elites control the show. And so Pareto's view, influenced by Machiavelli, who in turn was influenced by Plato, is that the elites come in two categories. The lions are the establishment people. They're, 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 uh, they're the people who say, you know, they're the monopoly intellectualists. They're the ones who, all, and they say this on the basis of already having the power. This is the key point, right? So it's a monopoly intellectualism based on the fact that, look, we have been dominant forever, you know, you're still here, you're doing okay, stick with us. Moreover, and this is where we talk about controlling the possible, if you do anything else, you'll fall off the precipice. It'll be chaos, it'll be doom, you'll be destroyed, right? And, and this is the lions, right? And so the lions, in a sense, the way they rhetorically appeal is through their apparent ferocity, right? There they are. They don't do anything. They just look fierce, right? And in fact, the way lions tend to, you know, and this is the part of the theory of lions, is that the, the way they really exercise their power is if they don't have to do anything. Because if they do, do have to do something, if they actually have to go after an opponent, right, uh, then they might actually lose some of that power. They may not turn out to look so hot, right, if they're actually in combat. So the idea is it's a kind of ferocity that then breeds a certain kind of, on the part of the opponent, fear, right? Fear, uh, you feel threatened, so you don't mess. You stay, right? And it's this kind of not calling the bluff, which is where the lions maintain their power, okay? And, and, and this is where I think Boris Johnson, who is a classical scholar, whatever else you want to say, um, I think was right on the money about Project Fear in the, in the Brexit campaign. The Remainers, right? That was it, all right, all right? I mean, they didn't really push how wonderful the European Union is. They pushed what you're going to lose if you vote against it. And so Boris was right on the money on this point, even though I'm a Remainer, and I say this in the book very openly. I'm a Remainer, and I wish we can reverse this, and maybe we will reverse this, because this is really up in the air at the moment. Um, but the point is, Boris was on the money when he, he got the measure of his opponents, and they were lions. They, it, and this was the same thing, Trump did the same thing to Hillary Clinton. Hillary Clinton was doing the same thing. Okay, and so this is this is the lions. Okay, now the foxes, who won, right, and they're the ones you know that end up making why the definition of 
post-truth ends up being so negative and so forth because they won. They understood what was going on, right? The foxes are all about saying, you guys who are in power, first of all, what you've done in the time you've been in office isn't all that great. There's still a lot of problems out there. It is not a clear how you're going to solve them. And on top of that, you're corrupt, okay? And, the re and in fact, the reason why you can't solve a lot of these problems you haven't solved is because you yourself are power hungry and you just want to stay in power, okay? So you give this very kind of it's very strong kind of ethical critique, you might say, of the people in power. That's very much part of what the foxes do. But the thing that's interesting about the foxes that really captivates the imagination of people um, is the idea of saying, look, what they're really doing when it gets down to it is they're preventing you from imagining futures that are possible. That's what they're really doing. It's a kind of political censorship that's going on. There is, a, you know, so if you're in, you know, if you're a Brexiteer, right? It's the free trade zone and all this kind of, right? Endless free trade. We'll be able to make deals with everyone around the world in a completely tariff-free world, right? We'll be able to do all kinds of amazing things that we can't do now, right? This is what the foxes are promising. They're promising the moon. And they're saying the thing that you think is so good is not really so good. And what that does in effect is to level the playing field. So the real thing that you, you know, as it were, the bird in the hand doesn't look as good as the two in the bush, that's the Fox's strategy. It's to level that playing field. And, and it worked in the case of both Brexit and Trump, because as we know, these guys, like all those Foxes, don't really have any kind of evidence to support this possible stuff is going to actually pan out. But they motivated it in a way, and they undercut what was seen as the accepted reality. So that's the Fox's move. Now, the point about calling circulation is that the Foxes don't last forever. This is an unintended, I mean, it's good for overturning the lions, perhaps, but then what do the foxes do after they've got power? And this is the thing we're struggling with at the moment with regard to both Brexit and Trump. What do you do with that? Do you turn into another lion? Which is kind of what Pareto and Machiavelli and uh, those guys say, right? You turn into a lion with your own sense of authority, your own kind of dominant position, right? That's the way the story normally goes. And so, but this is where we are at the moment with regard to the p the political climate that we're in. Now, you see there being certain advantages there, all right? The politics might have not gone the way some of us had hoped, but when there's less censorship and when we not distrust, but when we are allowed to not just think about the consensus of expert opinion and we're allowed to explore other types of knowledge. Right, wrong, true, right, right. false. Mm -hmm. It opens up what's possible when we think about what is available, what's the available pool of knowledge. And you see that as a very positive thing. Yeah. It gives us an opportunity to explore other ideas that, yes, may not be popular, but should be given at least equal uh, concern. Yes, and, and, and here I think, what I think in a way potentially changes the ball game from this kind of circulation of elites because the, the circulation of elites if you if you know anything about Machiavelli or Pareto or anyone in that tradition is that when this theory is being proposed it's usually in the spirit of cynicism right with regard to politics right that the people who are overthrowing the established order become the new order and then they get overthrown it just goes on and on and on right you might be familiar with this kind of attitude um I think one of the things that that ha, that is changing now, um, and this is something that people in the audience might be very interested in, in exploring, is the way in which the internet has democratized the situation. Because I think with regard to people like Machiavelli and Pareto, they were always imagining elites as remaining, uh, you know, elite is a word that means small, right? Minority. It's about basically minorities governing majorities. That's what elites are about. Um, but of course, nowadays, in terms of the sort of players who can actually intervene in this kind of political or even scientific dynamic, and we haven't even talked about science yet, but the same thing's happening in science as happening in politics, um, is basically, you know, if you can, you know, if, if, if you've got a website, if you have, you know, social media channel, right, you, you, you could potentially influence all kinds of things, right? 
uh, it's no longer just about, it's no longer the model of broadcasting, which was kind of the classical media model where a few elites basically broadcast to the masses and you had to be one of those elites in order to actually have any impact on anything. Now it's much more distributed, much more kind of level playing field. And, and I think this ends up, this is what potentially can change the dynamic. So it's not just a circulation of the same people kind of in the, because I think the circulation of elites model, when Pareto's talking about him, what he has in mind in the late 19th, early 20th century is parliamentary democracy. That's the thing he's looking at, right? They all come from the same schools. It's one party or another party, and they all just end up going in cycles. And I think, you know, the UK is a great example of, of the kind of thing that he was talking about, I would say. But if you start to bring in all these other factors that have to do with the way in which electronic media end up intervening in these processes, then it's not clear that you're just going to have an endless cycle of the same people changing roles, but you're going to have a, some, something a bit different, it seems to me. And I think that's the thing that is different about now. Well, let's move the conversation away from the political and towards the scientific, because that's what occupies the vast majority of this, this book. You, you look at how both sociology and science technology studies are, are post-truth sciences in their own right. It opens up the possibility of exploring other scientific ideas. I know the example that you use in the book, because it's been something that's been very close to your own career, is, is the dichotomy between intelligent design and evolutionary theory. Evolutionary theory has this kind of weight of the expert behind it, but intelligent design, at least you try and set up in the book, is as just a valid truth. And, and that jars some people's ears because they don't want to hear the idea that there's such thing as intelligent design. But I don't think you're approaching it because you necessarily believe in intelligent design. You approach it because you're interested in what it means to be able to play in a space whereby intelligent design could have equal weighting to something like evolutionary theory. Is that correct? Well, let me unpack this a little bit for those of you who aren't <laughs> familiar with your background. Quite, quite, quite on top yeah. of uh, what, what he said. I, I'm going to, first of all, I think the key thing about, so, so Luke began by talking about sociology and science and technology studies and all this. Um, and this is, these are the field, you know, I'm a professor of sociology after all, and my reputation is largely in this field of science and technology studies from an academic standpoint. Um, I think the key thing to pick up from those fields, at least the way I read them and the way they appear in the book, um, is this business that you, you may have heard of called social constructivism, okay? And I am a social constructivist. Now, what that means in the context of this discussion um, is that, um, let me, l l when people, when people in the, so when you do the sociology of science from a social constructivist standpoint, you're not just interested in the science as it's delivered authoritatively, let's say, in a published journal article. That's just the end product. You're actually interested in the process by which the thing actually comes into being. And one of the consequences of that, if you actually chart it, and you, you know, from the beginning of, uh, you know, the, 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 root, the, the chalkboard and the lab, and then you move onward to actually getting something that gets published and accepted by everybody, is that there are a lot of contingencies along the way. There's a lot of, a lot of uh, places where things could have been different, things could have been otherwise. But decisions get taken that end up closing off those alternative possibilities. Social constructivism is very sensitive to this kind of phenomenon. Now, of course, this is a phenomenon that's generally known throughout social life, but I guess within um, the context of science in particular, um, there is this view that because scientists are going after the truth and so forth, there is a certain kind of regimented way of doing it. And so if you're doing it the right way, you go one way and every other way is the wrong way. But what's, what, what science technology studies has done and through this social constructivist lens that it operates from is to show, no, there's contingency all the way. And there are points in history, if you take a long enough perspective, um, where certain kinds of options or ways of thinking about the world basically got closed off because at the time that a crucial decision was being made, perhaps with regard to resources, 
And the resources could be financial resources or they could be, you know, kind of spiritual resources. There are all kinds of resources in society that can close down arguments. It's not just always about money, though in our time it's often about money. Um, but the point is there are lots of ways of closing down options before they've actually had an opportunity to really fulfill their potential, you might say. Okay? Um, and, and, and this is – the post-truth condition is really sensitive – to this, and, and this is what I'm sensitive to in the book, is this. And intelligent design in this regard falls under this ambit, okay? Because basically, historically speaking, the scientific revolution came about, the Western scientific revolution, whereby uh, you ended up getting guys like Copernicus and Galileo and Newton and all those people in the 17th century, um, had a lot to do with the fact that people came to believe uh, that uh, they took literally in a way they hadn't done before. And this is where Protestantism made a big difference because, as you know, you may think about Protestantism, it involves a so-called literal reading of the Bible. In fact, Protestantism was the, brand, was the form of Christianity that actually made it required that people read the Bible to be a Christian, which wasn't required before. And that's why literacy was such a big deal in Protestantism in the way it hadn't been with Catholicism. Catholicism is just enough to go to Mass and, you know, Wow, the cineplex of the mass, right? With all the smoke and mirrors and all that. That was sufficient for Christianity. But with Protestantism, you actually had to read the Bible and believe it. And one of the things you're told in the very beginning is you're creating the image and likeness of God. And that meant you could potentially understand the universe. Okay? And that's where the intelligent design stuff came from. And that's why if you look at Newton, who is seen as kind of the benchmark for modern science... What is that exactly? That is about the, the, the theory of everything. The idea of understanding all of reality from first principles. Now, why would anyone even think this was possible? Right? I mean, no other culture was pursuing this kind of line. Other cultures have gods and they have all kinds of other things going on of cosmology and all the rest of it. But the idea that human beings in some way are created to actually be able to come up with the fundamental principles, the blueprint and so forth, that requires a very particular way in which you think about the relationship of the human to div divine. And that's what intelligent design is about. That God's mind is like our mind. Ours is a diminished version of it to be sure. But the point is, it's on a continuum. And that we are actually equipped to understand this stuff in principle. And that's what launched modern science. It was that attitude. And that was an intelligent design attitude. And it was motivating science well into the 19th century. You could see this in Maxwell. There's even hints of it in Einstein still. I mean, so, so this idea carries on, right? Now, in the context of the United States, which is where the intelligent design controversy happens, you have in that country a very particular interpretation of the separation of church and state, which means that you can't teach religion in the public school classrooms as anything other than religion. You can't teach it as having anything to do with science. And this is what the whole intelligent, intelligent design and creationism and all this stuff's about. Now, okay, so the first, so the thing I want to say is that post-truth motivates you to, to look, the, look, give a second look at, to this because this is a kind of tradition that actually historically was very important to, for bringing about our science, but it's been closed off and it's been closed off institutionally. Not necessarily that, because there's never been any experiment or any fact that showed that God wasn't involved, right? That, that's never been anything. No, it's a, no, at most what people say is, God's not necessary, right? That's the most you can get, right, from an intellectual standpoint. But institutionally, you want to shut down the argument. You don't want people thinking otherwise, okay? So it's an institutional issue. It's the monopoly intellectualism that I was talking about earlier now applied to science. Now, what has totally overturned this, I would say, is we go back to the internet. Because in this trial that, that Luke was referring to about a dozen years ago, when people from the local school district that, was, that were trying to teach intelligent design or have it promoted in some way, when they were asked, how did you find out about intelligent design? Because it's not actually being taught in any scientific uh, courses and universities or anything like that. They said, the internet. Okay? And so the internet and, 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 and the people who were promoting this stuff 
themselves had PhDs and they were themselves scientifically accredited in various ways, but they weren't doing it through the established peer review processes. They were doing it through the internet as a kind of alternative channel to get across views that they believed were legitimate, that they believed were being censored, institutionally repressed by the powers that be. And of course, the rhetoric surrounding the promotion of intelligent design and creationism is very much the foxy rhetoric, right? The establishment is shutting us down. They're not allowing us to speak, all the rest of it. And the establishment's response the evolutionists is very much like the lions because they're saying all these issues, all these problems that you say that, you know, with standard evolutionary theory, we'll be able to solve it by our own means. Just give it a little patience. Just be, you know, there's no need to suddenly start believing in God and so, or some alternative theory of intelligent design. Everything will be solved in its good time by just sticking with the Darwinian notion of natural selection and all the rest of it. It's a lions and foxes thing all over again, only applied in science. But what solidifies that knowledge is, is something you call in the book, or at least Thomas Kuhn, who, who originally used that term, a paradigm. So what solidifies that knowledge is, is something which is expert opinion and should be the opinion of many in the West. Are these things called paradigms? Yeah. And yet you're, you critique the idea of the paradigm because you think that science itself is limiting itself by sticking yeah. with these very dogmatic paradigms. Could you explain that just a little bit more? Because to many, yeah. uh, perhaps in this audience and both to my ears, that, that seems like a problematic standpoint to take. Although you kind of like the idea, and you, you mentioned it throughout the book, you kind of like the idea of, of aligning yourself with, with those who ignore ideas which are the dogmatic expert ideas. Well, look, it's not a matter of ignoring dogmatic expert ideas. The expert, dog, the, the, the expert ideas are all over the place, right? I mean, in a sense, it's trying to get beyond them. So it's not, a, you know, it, it's not about ignoring them. It's about being able to find a space to say something different. That's really what we're talking about here. It's hard to, you can't ignore what the experts say in the sense of not knowing what they say, right? I think that's a really important point, right? Expert opinion Everyone knows what the expert opinion is. This is why um, I often think that a lot of the um, surveys that are done in, in for the public understanding of science and science communication are, are bullshit in a way, because if all you're doing is asking whether people know stuff, right, they may actually know stuff. Do they believe it? That's the interesting question, Right. I mean, expert opinion is everywhere. If you ask anyone, what is it that people think about a certain topic? What is the received view, right? If you've thought about this at all yourself, you know what the received view is, right? That, that is probably the first thing you learn. What you have to learn is to how to unlearn it, right? How to come up with the alternatives to it. And that's the thing where the, that's where the repression comes in, it seems to me. Now, you were mentioning Thomas Kuhn. I take it this Thomas Kuhn is a familiar person to this audience? How many people have heard of him? Thomas Kuhn. Just get a sense. Okay. So we're talking about maybe 50%. So Thomas Kuhn is the most influential theorist of science in the second half of the 20th century. Okay. Um, and uh, he came up with this idea that um, the way you actually, if you want to do science, and, and, and he's talking about science as opposed to any other form of knowledge. Okay. So there are many forms of knowledge, but if we're talking about science, not religion, not anything else, um, you need a paradigm, and, a, and this is what Luke was saying, paradigm, and a paradigm has the following components. Um, enormous amount of consensus over fundamental metaphysical assumptions, what's the world made of, that kind of stuff. Um, methodology, how do you study the stuff? And then there is a very clear sense of what problems can this framework solve and have, has solved already. So there's agreement on that. So the problems that have been solved are agreed upon and the problems that have not been solved have been agreed upon. And all of those things have to be there, right? Because you can imagine some of these things missing, you don't have science, okay? And Kuhn is always thinking about the science that he came from, which is physics, and he's, teach, and he's thinking about Newtonian physics and, and his view being that when Newtonian, and, and, and when Newtonian physics, which was, which was the dominant way of thinking about science in general for 200 years from the end of the 17th century to the end of the 19th century, okay, 
Then we had these revolutions, right? Quantum mechanics, Einstein, relativity, all this kind of stuff. But then quickly after that happened, you got a new paradigm. And then the, and the physicists become, once again, in this very focused, narrow kind of way. That's the picture that Kuhn is presenting. And it's not by accident. This is a point I make, or I've made before, because I've written about, about Kuhn for, for a long time. Um, that when Kuhn was a student at Harvard in the, in the 1930s, late 1930s, he was part of a reading group on Pareto, who was being translated into English at the time. And so the way to think about the idea of paradigms and what Kuhn calls the scientific, the scientific revolutions, right? His book is called The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. That's the main book of his from 1962. Paradigms and revolutions are cyclical. The paradigms are the lions. The revolutions, which happen for a very short period of time, are where the foxes roam. But other, and, and, and this is where Kuhn was very different from his main opponent in his lifetime, and, and his opponent is the guy who I largely support, is Karl Popper, who maybe some of you have heard of. How many of you have heard of Karl Popper? Okay, about the same number, but somewhat different people. Um, now, it's interesting because, of course, Karl Popper is also known as this kind of political philosopher of the open society, a great liberal, and so forth, and he was Kuhn's main opponent. And Popper basically believed we should have foxes all over the place all the time, basically, right? That science should always be contested. It should always, it should always has, have its fundamental assumptions open for, you know, so in other words, from Popper's standpoint, there's no clear division between critical philosophy and scientific experimentation. He sees them as part of a continuum, whereas Kuhn would see a very clear distinction between the two, right? That the only time you can have a kind of critical philosophical perspective on science is when the science is falling apart on its own terms. And ha that's what Kuhn calls a crisis. He uses the word crisis in this technical sense. When a, when a science comes to realize it can no longer solve its own problems, right? That it's, you know, no matter how hard it tries, it's reached the limit. And so that licenses, in a way, a revolution. That's what Kuhn's view is, okay? Um, and, and so, but all of this is part of that same sort of circulation of elites kind of mentality, right? Where the, the lions are the paradigm people and the foxes are the revolutionary people. So would you say, Steve, that you align yourself more with the, with the foxes? Do you think post-truth is somewhat integral to, to scientific progress. In other words, do you think we're, yeah. by, by living in a post-truth age, we're, we're opening ourselves up to non-conventional thinkers and, and ideas that might have been previously ignored may in actual fact be the thing that leads to a certain degree of progress? Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I think exactly right. I mean, um, you know, if you think about where, where do these new ideas of alternative worlds, alternative ways of thinking about things come from, they actually do come from the past, actually, okay? I mean, I want, uh, this is a point that I think is always worth thinking about. Um, so, for example, uh, if you look at the, uh, so even if you stick to somebody like Kuhn, who's just talking about physics, and he's talking about the revolution, the Einstein revolution, and the quantum revolution in the early 20th century, and what was going on there, it is pretty clear that all those guys, whether we're talking about Bohr, Heisenberg, Einstein, Schrodinger, you name them, they all were looking at the critics from the past who had been marginalized. People like Ernst Mach and Leibniz and all these people had kind of relational notions of space and time and things like this. These are the sort of people that they were reading who, at the, at the you know, in terms of the physics establishment, even though these people knew physics and so forth, were seen as marginal, as mavericks, as philosophers, in that way in which you use philosophy to marginalize yourself from science. Um, but they weren't seen as kind of people who were contributing to science, but those were the guys who in fact provided the inspiration for the revolution that then took place. And I think this is, this is in a way part of the secret, right? That you have to take quite, I think literally, the idea that the way in which the dominant way of seeing things keeps its dominance is by suppressing past possibilities that could have been realized but weren't. And if you go back to those past possibilities that were generally thwarted or repressed 
for very contingent reasons having to do with the particular times in which they were first proposed, you realize there might be something there that's worth reviving and recovering and taking forward in a new period. And, and this is a point that I've made across my writing entirely, is, is that new ideas, the future, all this revolutionary stuff that we're so, we're so you know, rightly aspire to, is not just stuff that's cooked up from your head in some kind of creation from nothing kind of thing. It, it, anyone who does this with any degree of success is always recovering something that has been suppressed in the past. And that is the secret, right? And this is where studying history is incredibly important. Not to repeat it in some mindless fashion, not to show it as part of some master narrative or any of that nonsense, but rather to look at the stuff that wasn't realized the first time around that perhaps can be realized now because it's time has come. So ultimately, to, to forecast the future, what we need is a, a post-truth imagination. Is that what you're arguing for? Yes, and the post-truth imagination involves thinking about history differently along the lines that I'm thinking about it. Namely, you should think about history as a repository of unrealized potential. That is the way to think about history. Not as just, a, you know, kind of the detritus of the past or something like that. That's rubbish right? That's not the way to think about history. Most of the stuff that was possible in the past was never realized. That is a, that is a basic fact about history. Most of the stuff that was possible in the past has not been realized, perhaps for good reason, perhaps not. And I think that's the way you should go back and look at history with a kind of open mind on this topic, given that the way the world is now is not how the way the world was at the time those possibilities got suppressed. So in other words, the, the, the way to make uh, the, the prediction or the way to forecast the future is by looking at those pasts and rewriting those pasts? Is what, what, there a use to post-truth? Is there a use to prediction? Okay, look, I mean, this is where I think it's important that we get clear what we're talking about. Because the problem with the word prediction is that prediction carries a little bit too, too much of the implication of extrapolation, right? Where in a sense... Given the trends we see now, where are things going, right? As if there's nothing else in the world other than what we see now. But of course, if there is potential that's been unrealized, it may not be so much on the radar at the moment, but it may still be there nonetheless, waiting to be tapped. Okay? And so, insofar as prediction implies something like an extrapolation from what we already see, that is a false way of looking at the future. Forecasting is interesting because it's a much broader notion, right? The way you forecast something, right, in a way allows you to look at a sort of broader range of things. You're not just focused on the trends and tendencies that exist now, but you're looking at the kind of thing that, uh, well, you know, in the stock market. Uh, there are different kind of people who uh, do investments in the stock market, and, and there's a group of guys called the fundamentalists, right? The people who look at fundamentals, they look at the kinds of things about, you know, what kinds of things are solid? What kinds of things are open? What kinds of things have yet to be tapped? And that's where they pitch their analysis. They're not just looking at what's happened over the last six months. They're not just looking at even what happened over the last 12 or 18 months. But they're looking at stuff, you know, they're, they're, they're kind of doing a, a kind of, um, you might say, life course analysis, right? Certain things may be very strong now, may be very strong for the next six months, but they've already peaked. Whereas there are other things that have yet to be exploited. That's looking at it from the standpoint of fundamentals. And so this is where you need to think about the past as this kind of, you know, kind of like, a, like the way we think about raw materials, where we think about mining and we think about untapped resources, this kind of mentality. We should be thinking about the past with that kind of metaphorical understanding that there's a lot of stuff there we haven't really fully exploited. So if we were to be successful at looking at the past to allow us to, to predict certain futures, can we start playing in this space of super forecasting? And if so, what sort of frameworks do we need when we start making those sorts of far-flung predictions? Well, the whole thing about super forecasting, and this is, uh, so this is a term from Philip Pet uh, Tetlock, who's a political scientist, a political psychologist at, at uh, Berkeley, um, and... Uh, what we want to talk about here is the idea that 
super forecasting is basically what I've been talking about as forecasting, namely that you're just not you're not just interested in predicting particular events in, in the future and so forth, but you're you're really looking at a kind of long term horizon where in a sense things may in the in the short term actually stay more or less the way they are, but you can see that there's going to be a, a tipping point at some point in the future, that things are going to change, right? And and the idea about super forecasting is planning for that before it happens, right? So in other words, uh, the kind of thing that you can see down the road that's going to change things drastically, it may not be within the immediate time horizon that most policymakers are talking about, but nevertheless is likely or could well happen. And what you're doing is you're not trying to prevent it, but you're trying to, as it were, take strategic advantage uh, from it in advance. And and so, I'll give you an example of super forecasting that, that I talk about in the, the, the final chapter of the book, is um, there was this very important Cold War uh, policy analyst by the name of Herman Kahn. Have people heard of Herman Kahn? He's the man who came up with the idea of uh, thinking the unthinkable right? Mr. Doomsday. He is the model for Dr. Strangelove in the Stanley Kubrick movie from 1964. Um, and, and Herman Kahn wrote a series of books in the early 1960s. He was associated with the Rand Institute, Rand Corporation in Santa Monica, California, um, and, which was the leading kind of independent think tank that was advising the American government during the Cold War. Um, and, and Herman Kahn's idea was um, that rather than get preoccupied with whether we can stop a nuclear war from happening, um, his view was, let's assume a nuclear war happens. How can we take the most advantage of the situation? And so he scopes out what would a nuclear war mean, how much of the earth actually would be got rid of, and he estimated it would be no more than 25 or 30 percent at most only a few billion, not everyone, right? Um, and that certain things would be, you know, uh, the, the, the infrastructure, communication infrastructure would be uh, undermined, obviously, from it. There'd be a lot of issues, right? Obviously, in terms of trying to re reconstitute civilization in light of a nuclear war, um, you know, uh, and, and that would be bad, of course, but it might well happen. And so why not plan for it in advance? And so this is where the internet gets invented. Because the internet was invented as an alternative communication system, you know, in the event that the telephone lines get brought down in the case of a nuclear war. And that would impede, remember, we're talking about the 1960s here, right? Telephones matter a lot back then. Uh, and if all those telephone lines, there wouldn't be a way of communicating. So you need an alternative form of communication. And so this is where all of these computer-to-computer -computer communications start to get invented. Uh, and this is where ARPANET, right, uh, was the origin of it in the late 1960s. And why? Why did it come up in that context? Well, because the people in the U.S. Defense Department took Herman Kahn seriously, whereby there was a reasonable chance, I mean, it doesn't have to be more than 50%, but even if it's just 20% or whatever, that there could be an all-out nuclear war, you still want to be able to rebuild civilization, since, especially since it looks like even if there were a nuclear war, you wouldn't be getting rid of everyone anyway, right? So in other words, you shouldn't, you shouldn't end the game so quickly. Right? The worst that a nuclear war could do, given nuclear capability, would be to wipe out only 25-30% of the population. That still leaves 70%. You could do a lot with 70%, as long as you have the right infrastructure in place, and now it's the time to begin to build it. So this become now, of course, none of this stuff ever had to be used on a kind of mass distributed scale during the course of the Cold War, because we actually avoided this outcome. We avoided the worst possible scenario, right? So you know, full marks to the cold warriors in that regard. Um, but of course, we, we still got the internet. And once the cold war ended and all of this stuff was redeployed and put on the commercial market and so forth, then we got the wonderful world we live in now. Right? Not so wonderful world, depending on where you stand. <laughs> but it, it sounds to me as what you're establishing is the idea that a post-truth mindset actually has some use, actually has some 
utility and in that yep. case it gives rise to unintended consequences as unintended consequences it's, it's a driver for innovation right i mean in a very radical kind of way because you think about how do you you know where does innovation come from right if you think you know so in the classical studies of entrepreneurship and innovation um and joseph schumpeter the uh, economist coined the term entrepreneurship in the early 20th century um right his model his ideal was Henry Ford, okay? And the thing about Henry Ford that made him a real entrepreneurial innovator was it wasn't just that he introduced a product that sold a lot of, you know, uh, you know, he, that sold a lot and he made a lot of money out of it. That's not what makes you an entrepreneur. What makes you an entrepreneur is you reconfigure the market, right? And the market was personal transport. And the move away from the horse to the car at a mass level, that is the entrepreneurial moment. It's not just simply the invention of the automobile as another vehicle on the road with the horse, but rather reconceptualizing the whole notion of personal transport, that you end up reconfiguring the infrastructure in which personal transport happens. You change everything. You change the values. You change everything where the horse becomes totally marginal over, what, a decade, two decades in the, in the early 20th century. That's the kind of thing you're talking about. That is the creative destruction, the creative destruction of the market. Right. Where people come to a radically different way of thinking about how to satisfy their needs for personal transport that ends up in, in, in you know, changing infrastructure, value structure, everything. This is what doomsday allows you to do. Now, seriously, thinking about doomsday allows you to do that, because obviously, right, where would the motivation for the Internet have come from, given that. Under normal circumstances, we had perfectly good telephone lines and they were proliferating all over the place. And we were judging the, the, the advancement of people in terms of how many personal telephones people had. This was very much common practice. I mean, in terms of personal communication, you know, had we not thought about the possibility of doomsday, there would probably not be the motivation to create an alternative communication system. Everything would have been done through the telephone still today. But the other way in which post-truth is useful, and you touch it in the book, is it, it forces responsibility, whether it's responsibility and accountability to each other or responsibility in the way in which we interpret scientific knowledge and the way in which the public appropriates scientific yeah. facts allows people to be individually responsible, which allows for this innovation to run rampant. To well, I mean, the we thing, see, here's the thing. I mean, if let's go, we can go back to Plato to answer this question. One of the things that Plato was very, when, when Plato established this kind of monopoly intellectualism, one of the things he did not want to do was to do it, as it were, in his name or in the name of the philosopher king. In other words, it wasn't, a, it wasn't like a personal diktat kind of thing. People had to think it came from out there, right? And so as, if you've read The Republic, one of the things that Plato has in there is this idea of the myth of the metals, right? Where people are being taught a certain kind of idea about why they do what they do in the world. And, and it doesn't have to do with circumstance or accident, but it has to do with that they're made of certain things that make them appropriate for them to do it, right? So in other words, this is not social engineering, rather it's the nature of reality. And this has been very much the way the truth regime operates. In other words, you personally, the imposer of the truth regime, do not take responsibility. You project it. You've, you're like a ventriloquist. You put it out there and you say, nature's saying this, not me, man. I'm just a, I'm just a mouthpiece of nature. Nature is what has the authority here, okay? Post-truth condition removes that. This is the point, right? The post-truth condition, because we're talking about who's in charge of the rules of the game and that there are many possible people and players who could be in charge of the rules of the game, then everyone's agency is put in the spotlight, right? In other words, the would-be gods become players. They can no longer, as it were, project their authority on their creation because there are lots of them around. And so as a result, everyone becomes responsible and you have to then treat them as you would normal agents. So in a sense, it kind of normalizes kind of the way, you know, in other words, it, it takes the most fundamental issues about how we construct reality and it brings it down to a level where, where we're being able to judge people pretty much as we judge people normally, which is in terms of their own personal agency. Only it's personal agency that potentially has a lot of power to govern people's lives. And I think it's more important than that. It allows for scientists to speak freely. Yes. 
Yeah, so you're no longer just speaking. So the, the point about signs is, is useful here because politicians, to a certain extent, always have traded on their agency and their charisma and stuff like this. But the way in which scientific authority works is typically by, as it were, hiding behind the discipline, hiding behind the theory, hiding behind the paradigm. I am just a representative. I am, you know, I am, I am the authoritative spokesman on something that just doesn't come from me. It comes from all of this tradition, all of this paradigm, all of this stuff behind me. And that's what gives me authority. You see, it's removing that that is part of the post-truth condition, because you realize that's constructed. And on that note, I'm gonna give you guys some responsibility, which is to hunt, ask some audience questions. So uh, someone's about to earn themselves a drink, and the only person I trust with a microphone is David, so could I kindly ask you, we're very understaffed. Yeah. David uh, Triford, who's a wonderful moderator in his own right, um, it is on. Um, we're gonna go straight to this gentleman just here. Okay, but I, I do have a question myself. No. <laughs> and then we'll, we'll, we'll go straight the to mic you. Doesn't take away. Oh, we'll give you. We'll it. give you Mike's uh, Mike so prerogative. So I have a question to sort of map out a little bit uh, where you're coming from, and it's a very quick one. It's actually a two-part question. The first part is: Would you consider social constructivists like Michel Foucault lions or foxes? And the second part of that question is: With regards to the age of the internet of, and of this sort of democratization. Uh, where everyone has a level playing field, how does that play out? Well, first of all, I think Foucault and, and the whole deconstruction movement, which is kind of my own intellectual background, was kind of forged during the time this stuff was actually becoming known in English. Uh, they're foxes. I mean, they are foxes. I think uh, Derry, uh, you know, Jacques Derrida, who is very uh, contemporary, very obviously so, actually. Um, so I think these people are foxes. They were subversive. Um, uh, and they were subversive in, in, in very interesting kinds of ways. I think it's, for those of you who are younger and, and have come to Foucault later uh, the, 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 than I have, um, maybe it's hard to realize that Foucault actually was not originally an establishment figure, because I think maybe that's part of where your question's coming from, because within sociology and, and cultural studies, you know, Foucault nowadays is a paradigm. Right? And, 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 and I think part of what helped Foucault there was he died early. Because, because in a sense, I think a lot of the, you know, he's like, you know, Jim Morrison, you know, he's he's like he's, you know, he's like these, yeah, like these musicians. You mentioned Mozart. I was thinking of Jim Morrison. I was thinking about Jimi Hendrix. All these people who, in a sense, um, they, they they disappear before they can actually become what their followers turn out to be, you know, um, and 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 so. There is there, you know, Elvis, for example, could have died a few years early, right? I mean, uh, it would have helped his reputation a little bit. So just to, to, to complement the second part of my question, so how does uh, this sort of interplay between first come lions and then come foxes get disrupted by the appearance of things like internet? Oh, well, because well, the thing is, it, 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 it's no longer so obviously elite. This is the thing that's kind of interesting, right? Because the whole circula the, the, the whole model that I'm working with, uh, which I think is quite useful for the world up to now, in a sense, um, is that it presupposes that the players are relatively small. We're talking 80-20, this kind of idea. But with the internet, where in a sense, anyone can produce their own stuff, Right. Uh, and, and if and, and if they're technically competent, and of course, there are more and more media courses that allow people to produce their own stuff. I mean, this is one of the things where there's an enormous amount of power in media courses with regard to producing video and audio and all the rest of it, um, that potentially anyone with a certain degree of creativity can actually have an enormous amount of impact, at least for a short period of time. So maybe the gatekeepers of uh, the, these regimes of reality or of truth are not uh, dichotomous anymore, and maybe they are more... Well, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, this is why I said this, is, this marks the breakdown of the broadcast model. For, for those of you who study media, right, the thing about the modern era, you know, certainly starting with radio and television, uh, was that it was broadcast, namely relative, relatively few people, right, dealing with the masses and, and, and that you had to be part of that elite to actually to have any kind of impact. You see, that is the thing that's been obliterated. And that then does really change the picture, especially if you have more and more people who are quite competent, right, uh, with being able to produce stuff that has a lot of impact, even if they don't have a lot of resources in the ordinary sense. Thank you so much. Question just in front of you. Um, hi, um, 
when we talk about truth, the kind of conventional threat to truth has been bias or prejudice. And you do often ask a question of, do people look for truth or do people look for confirmation of their own bias? And if you accept that there is no such a thing as bias because there are multiple truths dependent on your background, ethnicity, nationality, da da da, you, you start to narrow you start to narrow the truth because uh, we're all kind of familiar with the idea of like layers of um, what is it layers of oppression. Um, you suddenly become, you know, there is your truth as a woman, your truth as an ethnic person, your truth as a, and you kind of narrow it down and you become your own individual with your own truth, at which point is it a truth or is it inherently subjective? Yeah. Um, first of all, I should say this is Veronica Lipinska, my uh, co-author in one of my previous books, The Proactionary Imperative. Um, we're, we're, we're kind of co-conspirators in transhumanism. Uh, and, and this, and this, the, the, this idea of being proactionary is closely connected to this doomsday stuff that I was promoting earlier, actually. Um, right. It appears in the book, but, uh, to answer your, the question directly, um, I think, um, this is where I think the issue of the way you, the way you kind of prevent the echo chamber effect and th this kind of everyone just in their own bias and because we kind of believe that there are multiple realities is they actually have to come into conflict with each other and they have to respond to each other. Okay. Um, and, and I think that's where, um, aren't we back to scientific truth then because we need to agree no, on no, terms well, of interaction. No, no. See what I, th what I think we, uh, I mean, Okay, so this is kind of a policy question because I, I I guess I take the premise of what you're saying, namely, if we, because in you know I've been uh, the way I've been presenting this to you about what the internet does is as if the internet opens the field of play to more peop to more people to kind of influence what everyone thinks, but of course they're going to be we already see that there are echo chambers, right? And, and there are filter bubbles and that in a sense, people in a sense don't necessarily want to be influencing everyone. They just want to reinforce what they think. And the internet allows that. Um, and this is where I think that there's a policy issue here about, you know, regulation of the internet and so forth. Um, so I would be in, so I think what we need to reinvent within the internet is not scientific truth, but a public sphere. Okay, the public sphere, which is this kind of again, does this does this term mean anything to anyone? The public sphere? Have you heard of this term? No, this is very interesting. I'm glad we got this on film. Okay, Jurgen Habermas would be very disappointed. Um, no, the public sphere is the idea uh, which was created by the newspaper culture, basically in the late 18th and 19th centuries, that no matter what walk of life and so forth you're in, that there are certain things about the way your society works the way it operates, that everyone should be concerned about. It's a sort of a precondition for a rational democracy, right? So as more and more people got the right to vote, this helped to boost new newspaper circulations because people started to think they suddenly had a responsibility to participate in the way their country was governed, so they needed to find out what the hell was going on, right? I mean, those, those two things did go together in the 19th century. I know this is ancient history, but it's worth recalling. And, and so this thing was called the public sphere, Right. And one of the things that people say about the Internet uh, is it decimates this. Right. Because you can have these filter bubbles and these echo chambers and things. And even if you're dealing with, you know, conventional newspapers and so forth, um, you can customize them. Right. To just get the kinds of things you want to hear about the news feeds, all the rest of it on social media. Right. You can do so much customization now that it becomes impossible to talk about a pub public sphere, namely a common shared social reality, which you should expect everyone to have an interest in. Right. This is why there's such low voter turnout in politics among young people. Right. In political elections, I mean, of course, people protest and all the rest of it. But the point is, in terms of the, the sort of established forms of politics that are associated historically with the public sphere, like voting. Right. It's really hard to get young people out there. Right. You need something like momentum to sort of drag you by the 
coattails and threaten you, right? You know, the sort of Corbinista sort of approach. That's the only way you can get people to become participate in what would have been normal in, in democratic politics in the 19th and most of the 20th centuries. Okay. And, and so the thing is, how do you reinvent that idea of a public sphere? There's this common space where in a sense we have to go beyond our filter bubbles, beyond our echo chambers, and we actually have to engage with each other because there are some things, you don't have to call it truth, but there's some things that we have a common stake in. And so it becomes important who's the prime minister. It becomes important whether we do Brexit, right? It becomes important certain kinds of issues, regardless of what our differences might be otherwise. That's something that has yet to be reinvented within the internet. Shouldn't top of that list be something like climate change? So yeah. that's something that's going to affect us all. But again, that's at the mercy of something like post-truth. It's a conspiracy. Some people argue but climate change is a conspiracy. It's not real. And then there's scientific evidence to the contrary of the popular expert belief. And then we're back into the, the well, dissolution, I, the breaking of the public sphere. No, no. I, I, I think that's an interesting example, actually, climate change. Because, um, I mean, I speak as someone who believes in climate change, that it's happening. And I believe it's anthropogenic for the most part. So, in other words, I believe this, this kind of idea that since the Industrial Revolution, human beings have been the ones who've been most responsible for the climate change on the planet carbon emissions, that kind of thing. I, I think that's, to my mind, it's pretty uncontroversial. What's controversial is what you do about it, okay? Um, and, and I'm a little surprised, and to, to, to answer your question, that there actually isn't more open public debate or even voting about stuff like this, right? These things are decided in policy summits internationally, right? I mean, they're decided in pretty elite places when it gets down to it and then all the disagreements are just allowed to flourish without really having much contact with each other so you have a kind of this echo chamber filter bubble thing which is pretty much characteristic of the public nature of this controversy at the moment they're not really engaging each other but i'm surprised that no politician that actually wants people to vote on these things i would have thought it would have been it would be an interest if you could have people vote on whether to stay in the european union you could have people vote on climate change you know, and that would be a way of forcing people then to engage with each other, you see. Um, so I do think the climate change issue is an issue which would be relevant to this public sphere idea. But it's interesting that politicians in a way, I don't know, they don't trust people to, 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 to argue about this and take a vote on it. Or is it too slow of a burn as an issue? Does it need to be something crazy like aliens or asteroids that are about to hit us that would make us look, certainly Europe collectively care about a look, singular well, you, you tell me why membership in the European Union was so urgent to vote on again in this country. Really, that wasn't very urgent. You, you can make anything seem urgent. I mean, if you could vote, I mean, I, I, to be honest with you, I didn't see any particular reason other than the fact that there was this party, UKIP, that was stirring up a lot of nonsense. Uh, and Cameron wanted to deal with that. And that was why he called the referendum. There was no particular public reason, no public outcry to have a referendum on Europe. It was for purely party political reasons. And because Cameron actually is a pretty, was a pretty good politician, actually, in many respects, in terms of being able to do this kind of shit, he just got this wrong. But it was a very trivial reason why we had the European Union referendum. There was nothing deep going on here. It was about margin. And he did succeed in killing UKIP. So give him a little credit for something here. He killed UKIP, and that was the point. The problem was that it, he did it without the outcome he wanted. There's another question here. Moving swiftly away from Brexit. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Well, thank <laughs> you. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Fuller, thank you so much for that captivating talk. I didn't think I'd be so enthralled on a Tuesday after a bank holiday, <laughs> but uh, thank you so much. Um, your book sounds, and in what you've said now, almost reads as like a defense of post-truth, yeah. or at least a critical rethink. Edward Bernays did the same with propaganda. There is you that go. a fair comparison? Well, <laughs> Bernays is a figure in my book. He, in fact, he even appears in the glossary. So, so, I'm yeah. using him in my dissertation, so he's a big, important, important guy for me too, I guess. Well, no, no, but the, the, the thing is that, that see, Again, I don't know how much one should go into this, but he's, you're right on the money about this. Because do you know who Edward Bernays is? Let, let's start with basics here. Um, how many of you know who he is? Obviously, some of you do. Okay, so, so Edward Bernays is the father of public relations. Now, the key thing about him in this argument, especially, you know, I mentioned Walter Lippmann earlier, right, as being the father of objective journalism and all that. 
Both Lippmann and Bernays um, worked on this campaign that Woodrow Wilson had to get America to fight in World War I. Now, the reason why that's kind of important is because World War I was a war that was fought not on American soil. And most of the people who had migrated to the United States wanted to get away from all that nonsense of violence and war that was happening all the time in Europe. However, they managed to, Lippmann and Bernays, both of whom were in their 20s at the time, young men, both of them, they were part of the first generation of Jews who were allowed to go to Ivy League universities, all this kind of stuff. They were working for Wilson, and they actually managed to convince America to get into a war that was not being fought on its soil, and to actually sacrifice quite a lot of lives when it got right down to it, okay? Uh, and to end the war, because the, the pitch, the public relations pitch was, you immigrants owe something to the homeland you come from because the stuff you've brought from the homeland has made America great. Okay? So this was what began, the, this was the end of American isolationism. Isolationism, which now you're in a sense kind of seeing again because of Trump, um, was the default position of the United States until World War I. The United States did not get involved in battles and, vo and wars in other countries as it was going up. But then World War I changed the whole thing. Now, Bernays and Lippmann drew radically different conclusions from their involvement in this successful campaign to get Americans into World War I. Uh, Lippmann said, we don't want to let the genie out of the bottle here. Public relations is incredibly powerful. You can, you know, with good ads and so forth, you can get people to do anything, right? Even things that go against, you know, that end up leading them to sacrifice their lives. So we have to put this under strict government control. And those of us who are part of the media have to act in a very responsible public interest kind of manner. That was Lippmann's view. Bernays' view was, whoa, we could, you know, democratize this. Why does it have to just be in the hands of the government? And we can make money out of this. It's the same stuff, right? But 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 different attitudes toward it, and and um, you know, if you look at what happens in the 1920s with regard to how the uh, the broadcast media start to regulate itself, like the differences between what happens in the U.S. with regard to commercial advertising being much, very much the dominant form in which broadcast media operates, versus what happens in this country, for example, with the BBC and this much more controlled kind of regime. It's this kind of, it's a playing out of this kind of debate between Lippmann and Bernays, basically. And it's around this idea that Chomsky popularizes in the 1980s about the manufacture of consent, right? Um, and Lippmann introduces this phrase to talk about what Bernays was doing with public relations, manufacturing consent. Bernays spins it and says, hey, I'm an engineer of consent, right? So in other words, there's a science going on here. Um, and, and this science, of course, is the science that becomes the science of market research and public opinion polling and Gallup, and, and it's what leads us to Cambridge Analytica now, right? It's, it's this kind of a straight line from Bernays to Cambridge Analytica, you know, technologically enhanced or whatever, but it's, it's that line. And this was the thing that, this was the genie that, that Lippmann did not want out of the bottle, okay? Um, and, 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 this, and, so, and, and for those of you who are involved in the media, you may know that the people who consider themselves journalists versus people who consider themselves public relations people are antagonists, mutually antagonistic typically. And this is the lippmann bernays difference. Even though they both come from the same roots, the kinds of conclusions they draw. On the one hand, one being more Platonist and saying, we got to be very careful about what we say to people and so forth, right? Democracy is a very volatile thing, you know, very much like Plato, versus saying, hey, this is a free world. Everyone can think for themselves. If you want the product, get it. If you don't, don't, you know, it's open, you know? And, and so this is the world where, this is the difference between the truth regime of someone like Lippmann and the post-truth regime of someone like Bernays, which influences public opinion. And, and I uh, would recommend, for those of you who don't know about Bernays, that you read his book, Propaganda, from 1928, um, where the word propaganda is used in a neutral to positive manner, because this is before World War II and propaganda research and all that kind of stuff, okay? And, and you begin to see that this is not such a straightforward issue.
It's not such a straightforward issue. But you're you're, you're very you know good to point this out because Bernays is in a way the standard bearer for the kind of post truth kind of position um, that Lippmann was against. And Adam Curtis is the gatekeeper. Yes, well. exactly. Adam Curtis is the gatekeeper. Excellent. Yes, exactly right. Question just up the back here. Two more. So you were saying that um, the internet allows for a greater e exposure to knowledge, but are we not watching it getting carved up at the moment with the likes of Instagram, Facebook, and all of Twitter, which already segregate? They're the new powers in terms of media, as we've seen with Cambridge Analytica, with Facebook already influencing public opinions and Trump election and Brit Brexit happening. So are we already not watching the internet getting carved up in these new mega media corporations forming? Yeah. No, no, I agree with you 100%, which is one of the reasons why it was very interesting to, to listen to Mark Zuckerberg when he was before Congress and before uh, the par parliament here uh, about the kinds of questions that were being posed to him. Because even though it was very interesting because I, I, I was very surprised about how uh, disparaging people on the internet were about the kinds of questions the politicians were posing to Zuckerberg, which were entirely reasonable. I mean, this is the thing that th this is something about the kind of age we live in now that that uh, there are a lot of people out there who think that you can um, disparage or dismiss quite legitimate concerns of the kinds that you're raising in your question simply because you're not the most technically adept person in the media that you're talking about. OK, and as soon as you get into that kind of trap where you're dismissing politicians simply because they don't really know how Facebook works, blah, blah, you know, um, then democracy's doomed, right? So I think a lot of the stuff that the politicians are trying to do now actually aim to address the issues you're raising. And, and, and I think this is one of the reasons why, if you actually look at the way Zuckerberg responded, he was taken aback. It was quite clear. He wasn't fully prepared. He's, in a sense, he's not quite on top of everything he's kind of unleashed from the standpoint of its overall social and political consequences. And he's going to have to catch up pretty, pretty fast. Otherwise, I could see governments trying to impose very serious kind of regulation. And also to do with the post-truth, um, it's kind of a deterministic point of view. So how can you say that the past events can determine what can provide a kind of framework for what will happen in the future and then still at the same time have agency because that's contradictory in a sense. Well, look, I mean, I think the issue here has to do with um, how you think about the past. I mean, um, so I'm talking about the past primarily in two ways. One, with regard to the internet is I actually do think there is a, that the internet does change the field of play on all, a lot of this stuff that I've been talking about from the past. So I'm, I think it should be clear that I think that there is an issue that the internet definitely facilitates a certain kind of democratization that I think no one who had talked about this stuff in the past had quite realized. So I think that that's happening. But I think generally speaking, if you're thinking about the past, you shouldn't be thinking about the past as just a kind of a burden or something that, that determines the future, but rather you have to think about it as a kind of repository of potential, only some of which has been realized. So yeah, there are certain things from the past that have a kind of important impact on the future, uh, but that's only because we're only paying attention to those aspects of the past. If we paid attention to different aspects of the past, we could end up with a different future. So in a sense, our, you know, the openness of the future lies with our ability and our willingness to open up the past again. And that's why history is actually a very important thing to look at. And then uh, David Dean and then yourself, but you got to make them quick. He was, he was here for a while. Oh, go on. We can manage. Very big folks. <laughs> it's a quick one, I promise. All right, um, thank you, sir. Yeah, I mean, I hate to defend the lions. A little bit, but uh, uh -huh. I, guess, I guess the question I have is, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but you seem to be arguing very much that the lions are intrinsically hostile to the foxes. Um, and I'm just not sure that's borne out by history, actually, in many, in many cases, both within the historical realm and the scientific realm. Um, there's, there's 
numerous examples where the overthrowing of a hegemonic view or a, a historical acceptance is welcomed and excited, perhaps not by the specific individual whose view is overthrown. But, but generally speaking, within our, perhaps I'm talking more in the academy than within society, but there is loads of examples where that happens, where a lion view is overthrown and relatively either accepted, but also people change their views and it becomes ex uh, a kind of uh, accepted. Yeah, yeah. So the question I'm asking is, I guess, really is not all foxes are created equal. Uh, and so how do we, if we're going to talk about post-truth in this sense, you talk about it having an ability to create, I think you said um, for innovation, but of course it also has an intrinsic possibility for destruction. Um, and I guess this li lies around truth, but Holocaust denial could be viewed as a fox. Climate change denial could be viewed as a fox. Um, and yet, do we, essentially I'm saying, can we, do we put a value on different types of foxes based on the quality of their arguments and positions? Well, I, I think this... Let me go back to Kuhn in terms of answering your question. It's probably the most straightforward way of doing it. Kuhn's point, which I think has some bearing, is foxes are welcomed for a limited period of time in terms of overturning the established authority as a prelude to establishing a new authority. Okay? So, um, you know, uh, and, 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 and the way in which particular foxes come into this position of being able to overthrow an established authority is not arbitrary, okay? I think it's really important when you look at, let's say, in the history of physics, that when we talk about the Einsteinian revolution, okay, uh, and, and you've, you may, some of you may know, if you know something about Einstein's biography, right, at the time that he, he wrote these three papers that turned out to be so revolutionary in 1905, he was working as a patent clerk in, in Bern, right, in Switzerland. Um, but that's, that, in a way, is a diversion from what really m enabled him to be revolutionary, and that was he submitted these articles to the leading physics journal, and the editor of the journal, Max Planck, uh, kind of saw the potential in these things and cleaned up a lot of the math and did a lot of editing to enable these, the, these articles to actually have the full impact with his imprimatur on them that enabled the, the revolution to start to happen in physics, okay? So he's not any old fox. Einstein's not any old fox. Just because Einstein failed some exams and stuff like that, which people like to always trot out and so forth, that, that's in a sense a bit misleading. What matters is what I've just told you right? That there was a way in which this foxiness could get channeled into an established authority, which then begins the trail in which the new established authority happens, okay? Um, now, Kuhn says that's the very desirable, because what you don't want is a lot of foxes questioning everything for long periods of time, because what that would do is just undermine science altogether. What you want is quick resolution and everybody back in lockstep, Okay, and so that's the kind of foxes we're talking about here in the case of Kuhn. Now, the question is whether that's adequate, right? Whether that's adequate. Um, and, and regardless of whether you think it's adequate from a normative level, in other words, the way it ought to be, the fact is now that we've got the internet and we've got so many competing sources of authority going on all over the place, I think it's going to be harder in the future to maintain this kind of picture that Kuhn presents you know, let's say with regard to Einstein. I think it's going to be much harder to have this kind of easy closure with a new establishment afterwards. Can okay, Dean and David very quickly, otherwise I have to buy you guys drinks when I give you a... So, actually, that, that last question, I got half of mine. I was going to say, as well as foxes, we do have to worry that we have all sorts of weird marsupials <laughs> running around as well. There's platypuses and wombats and everything else. Uh, and the question is how we distinguish between the proper foxes, if you like, that have been around from hi all of history with, you know, this house believes X is a lions versus foxes debate. Um, and the, the, the issue is that we're getting all the, the strange animals, but also we're also confusing lions with dinosaurs as well. And so does the internet basically turn this dichotomy of lions versus foxes into a much broader spectrum on both sides? And if so, what do we do? A little, a little bit. I, I mean, a little bit. I, I think what it does is it... it so, so yes, maybe there's a, a little bit more blurring, but I do think, to be honest with you, if you look at the internet... So again, you know, Luke was mentioning, I've been very much involved in the evolution creation controversy for a long time now. Um, 
And you've got actually, I think you can see the lions and fox. You see the lions and foxes thing. I mean, because there are all kinds of people, let's say, not, it's not like the internet is just full of people who are against the establishment. There are a lot of people on the internet who support the establishment, even though they don't have much status themselves, right? I mean, so you'll have people fighting the corner for evolution and for Darwinism and for Richard Dawkins and all of this kind of stuff, even though they themselves are not especially credentialed or knowledgeable or anything, but they, as it were, take the side of the lions on this matter, right? And so, so... So I think what you're seeing is, in a way, a democratization of the distinction rather than a blurring of it when, it when you actually look at the Internet, right? So in a sense, Richard, you know, Richard Dawkins and a lot of these you know, arch evolutionists don't actually have to, you know, they don't have to argue with everyone so much themselves. They can just leave it, leave it to their fans, right? These people have loads of fans and their fans are not necessarily PhDs in evolutionary biology, but they believe what PhDs in evolutionary biology do. And so they become proxy lions, right? So a proxy, you can be a proxy lion on the internet, right? You, you, you can, you can, you, you can castigate your neighbor, you know, and call him an ignoramus and everything, even though you yourself are no more credentialed than he is, as long as you're believing in the lion's view. Slightly more basic. Very happy that someone mentioned PR earlier because we're in probably, I would argue, a, a bubble of startup world, of entrepreneurship, of accelerators and whatever, which without being that specific are in the foxes category. They're bringing disruption, which given how much banking I was able to do on my phone this morning is a good thing in most areas. And you want more people involved in the public sphere and getting more engagement, which I'd argue also is much more in the Fox's end of things. Yes. Can't we have a better, more engaging label than post-truth? Because there's such a negative, certainly for me, connotation with it. Because if post-truth means like after truth, and if we've gone past truth, we must be in something that's not true and that could be not very good. Well, Can we brand it a little bit better? Well, look, I mean, I... I am, I'm only as good as the material I deal with. I mean, no, um, no, but the point is post-truth is the word. Um, and, and in a sense, I guess what I'm trying to do in terms of configuring post-truth in a way like postmodernism, okay? Um, and and uh, part of what postmodernism was trying to do uh, was to go meta on modernism. And that's what post-truth, this is at least my conception of post-truth, is that it goes meta on truth. It's not just talking about what's true or false, but rather talking about the conditions under which things are allowed to be true or false. I, I, yeah, I get that. And I think this audience will, but to, to get it to the people outside who don't have the benefit of being here, because I think with postmodernism, if you put it with architecture, it's a bit easier to understand. That's a modern building. That's not a modern building, and it's come afterwards, and and that's kind of my oh, I see, yeah, my, my questioning. If um, I totally agree, not not that because we normally do agree, as you know, but I totally agree with where you're going with this. I'm just saying, can we not find a different approach to actually get far more people engaged, to be more fox-like, to get better lions, to get more activities that are less uh, in their little bubbles. Yeah, I mean, I'm sympathetic to what you say, and, and, and there may be a version of this in the next five, ten years with a different name. Um, so I'm not, I do, uh, no, no, but the, but, the, but the thing is that I, I do think that for our time, because I do think the negative spin on post-truth is actually quite bad, because I think what's going on in the negative spin of post-truth is, is this kind of revenge of the lions thing going on. This is a lions thing the negative spin on post-truth. And, and I think it's part of the project fear and it's part of all of this stuff. Uh, in a way, it brings out the worst tendencies of the sort of e expert, elite, authorita uh, authoritative culture. And, and unfortunately, academics are very strongly implicated in this, right? Because I, I have yet to run across an, any academic who actually likes who would associate themselves with post-truth in any kind of way other than diagnostically with regard to other people, okay? Um, and, and so I do think that at the moment, at the moment now, post-truth needs some rehabilitation as a term. That's my point. 
So, Steve, I suppose my final question is, what would that post-truth utopia look like for, for post-Brexit Britain? And I was a Remainer. Should we just make the best of a, uh, of a terrible situation and take the best of the EU policy and then go build a little seasteading institute with the Americans in the middle of the ocean and, and do all of the proactionary things that we wanted to do using Airstrip 1, i.e. Britain as the as the laboratory for that? Well, look, or does a post-truth utopia look like something slightly different? Well, look, I mean, I think with regard to seasteading and all these other kinds of possibilities, um, those are always available to people with the money, right? And so in other words, if you want to create your alternative reality, um, I don't think anything's going to stop you from doing that. And it might actually be quite successful in its own right. So God bless you, right? Elon Musk and Peter Thiel and all these people, you know, let them go ahead and do it. Um, uh, but I think with regard to the rest of us, um, I think the the, the post-truth utopia is, is just simply a matter of, of being aware of actually the openness and the possibility for change. So I think in terms of, you know, post-Brexit Britain, let me put it this way. At the moment... At the moment, it seems that so-called intelligent, reasonable people um, think that what we should really have is a kind of exit from the European Union that respects the vote of the people because we're leaving the European Union officially, but basically keeping everything that the European Union has, customs union and all this sort of stuff. Um, now, I agree with the Brexiteers that this is indeed the worst of both worlds, okay? So in other words, this so-called moderate position that's being promoted at the moment, um, I think that is actually the worst of both worlds. And that in a sense, what we really should do is either not do Brexit, which is my preference, or do full fat Brexit and listen to what those radical Brexiteers are saying, because they actually do have a vision. People like Gove and Johnson and all these, Jacob rees mogg they actually do have a vision. But what I think is the worst of both worlds is kind of the middle of the road position. I re and that's why I think there's a real argument here. And what I worry about, and this is the thing I worry about, is that, that, that what's happening now is that there's an attempt to try to close it down by settling in this kind of compromise position that just screws us over probably more than the other two would. That's my view. So on that note, I just want to say a couple of thanks. Firstly, to Ju Juju Bar for hosting us tonight, and a massive thanks to Juliet and the events team here, to the bar staff, and of course to Iva, who makes it possible that you're able to actually hear us. Iva is a wonderful character in his own right. And I want to thank all the, the volunteers and David for helping out, and to our film team. It's because of them that we're able to make everything that we uh, curate here freely available online, under YouTube, under Virtual Futures. And if you like what we do, please support us not financially, you've done enough by buying a ticket and being here, but if you have ideas and you want to contribute to the sorts of things that we're curating, please come forward and let us know. We're at Virtual Futures everywhere online, and because it's Virtual Futures, we have to end with a warning, and it's the warning that we end every single Virtual Futures with, which is this. The future is always virtual, and many things that may seem imminent or inevitable never actually happen. Fortunately, our ability to survive the future isn't predicated on our capacity for prediction, although, and on those much more rare occasions, something remarkable does come of staring the future deep in the eyes and challenging everything that it seems to promise. I hope you feel you've done that tonight. Please join me in thanking the incredible Professor Steve Fuller. The bar is now open. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.